So welcome to lecture two in the History Methods course. We're going to be looking at um, chronology, causation and significance in this lecture. So I've divided it up into three parts and we'll look at those concepts one by one. And then at the end we'll um, consider how these relate to the reading and to the tasks that I'm asking you to do this week. So uh, in this part we're talking about chronology and, um, and we'll go on and think about the other, um, the other concepts in the rest of the lecture. So it's important just to think about how this connects back to the very first lecture when I was talking about um, various aspects of academic history. Uh, and these are all key ways in which historians establish patterns and offer historical explanations. So we do that in three ways, by placing events in relation to their time and context, what we might refer to in this part of the lecture as chronology. Uh, secondly, we relate them to other factors and explain why things happened. We'll call that causation. And thirdly, we make judgments about what events and people were important, and we'll refer to that as significance. And in these three ways, in, um, historians try to make this huge morass of all things that happened in the past into an intelligible um, form of information that people can engage with. <clears throat> so <clears throat> when we're talking about chronology and time, clearly these are kind of fundamental concepts to any conceptualization of history. I'm just drawing on the work of Dawson here who differentiates between four types of time or four ways in which history teachers might usefully think about their use and reference of the idea of time. So um, he calls these T1 through to T4, <clears throat> meaning four ways of thinking about time. So T1, uh, history teachers are teaching children to understand the vocabulary of time. Uh, AD, BC, centuries, decades, period, era, etc. The list is actually tremendously long and some of the terms are fairly kind of specialist and esoteric. But there is a language that we need to use and become familiar with and that's part of our basic teaching. T2 is to develop a sense of period. So the names of periods of history, how historians tend to divide up the centuries and millennia, um, the key events that happen within each of those periods, what are the defining features of the period, and some sense of what life would be like in each period. So, so that if someone says the age of imperial expansion or the Renaissance or the, the um, end of empire, then that, that conjures up for people with a historical understanding some sense of the period of time, how life was changing, what comes after it, and what's distinctive about using that as a reference point. T3, says Dawson, is a slightly broader framework, a framework of key events and issues related to the curriculum. So obviously the, the curriculum in the country you're um, based will be different from the curriculum that I'm familiar with, but we'll each have our own framework. And ch as children develop a broader sense of that framework of key ideas and events and people, they should also be developing some broader thematic sense of, of what connects those. So we should be thinking about the broad underlying framework of themes like conflict, prejudice, economic development, and they will run across historical periods and provide a sense of change over time. And then finally, T4 is this much more general sense of, of how we set understanding in the broader context of change over time. And there are many ways in which we can achieve this, but it's, it's important to think about that broad sweep of human history and how, how some things take thousands of years to change and other things change incredibly rapidly. So some practical ideas immediately now, we're talking about chronology, um, suggestions for T1 teaching activities, really basic things to check vocabulary and understanding and, and a real sense of what these terms mean and signify when the historian uses them. So you could just give a list of terms that you might use in the next um, year's worth of history and get, and get the children to put them in the right order from the shortest to the longest just to check that there's a basic understanding. A slightly more elaborate version for older and more able students might be to give them different types of um, period descriptions and then ask them to sort them both into order and into category. So typically we might um, use terms like the Tudor period and students need to know that that refers to the period when the Tudor family were on the throne. Um, there'll be general terms like medieval or dark ages, but there'll also be um, particular terms that we might use to refer to um, 
aspects of the arts, for example, Impressionist or Pre-Raphaelite period or Cubist. So um, this moves the children on and, and just gives them some familiarity, but it has the teaching benefit of enabling us to make explicit points about this type of language and to teach these meanings explicitly um, before we go on and just want to use them as part of our general teaching vocabulary. So it's an important um, information giving and information checking purpose to these kinds of basic teaching activities. If we move on to uh, T2 activities, well what, one useful thing here is just to study a picture. So T2 is about getting that in-depth sense of a period of time. So here, classic example drawn from the UK uh, curriculum, here's a picture of Queen Elizabeth I. Um, there are loads of useful images that you might draw and this could be from architecture or the production of maps or portraiture of leaders, um, pictures of everyday life, so it doesn't really matter what you use but it's just useful to pick sources that would give you some kind of insight and generate some kind of conversation. So if we were studying this picture, typically we'd use this with a class of 11 or 12 year olds. Um, what might they spot? Well they might spot that out of the two windows there's a kind of before and after scene. On the left we see these sailing ships and on the right you see them having come to uh, no good in the, um, in the storms. This is in fact uh, about the Spanish Armada, so we might introduce that as a historical fact. But if we're just using this to develop a sense of time and period, then it's not absolutely essential at this point to note that this is the Spanish Armada coming to England and then being defeated. What's important is to get a sense of the technology. So from here we can think about the importance of um, shipbuilding, the importance of the Navy to the British Empire, the importance of, of the Navy to trade and, and all sorts of other related issues. So we can get, get some sense. We'll talk about Elizabeth I. This is the world of technology that we're inhabiting. Uh, there are more basic things. So we can look at how people appear in this period of portraiture and we can look at how pale her face is and we can talk about how fashions change. We might also talk about uh, how people whiten their faces effectively with poisonous um, cosmetics and the kinds of risks that people played, uh, the risks that people had uh, to their health through those kinds of activities. We would obviously talk about the wealth of the royal family, which is evident in the uh, multiple chains of pearls around her neck and, of course, in the, the way the crown is set with uh, precious stones. But the crown is there as a symbol of royalty and the power of the throne as well. And then finally, uh, it's fairly obvious it's there in the foreground. We might notice that she's got a hand on the globe and this shows that this is the beginning of the age of imperial expansion, that trade and discovery were important features of her reign. So just by using this picture, which has been constructed with all of these clues in deliberately, this is a deeply symbolic representation of the period and her time on the throne. By starting to unpick that, getting students to think about these details, we can use this as a way into this period of time now clearly um, a further activity is to then compare images from different periods of time and before and after to get a sense of uh, how things change in a period of time. So this is from the second Elizabethan reign in the history of England, Queen Elizabeth II, who's currently on the throne still. Uh, and here's one way um, that uh, a newspaper recently celebrating the Diamond Jubilee, 60 years on the throne, helped its readers get a sense of how the country has changed during her period of time on the throne. So we've got a picture from the beginning of her reign and a picture at the end. And it's useful when you're developing these kinds of activities to, to explicitly talk about change and continuity, what's staying the same, what is changing within a period of time, so that we don't create the idea that each of these periods of time, because we have labelled them, in this case the reign of Elizabeth II, are somehow static or uniform, that there are changes within that period, but there are some also distinctive features um, that would distinguish this period from earlier and later periods. So it's important to think about change and continuity within and between periods of time, and pictures are a fantastic kind of shorthand way in to describe some of those changes. And then a third example of how we might do this, a very basic tool of the history teacher, is to use timelines in the classroom and you could construct these collectively. As a te you can do it individually as a teaching resource on the wall, you can do it collectively with the classroom and you can obviously get children to do this in their books. So here's an example that I've just taken from this uh, secondary teacher's uh, website. 
that a period, um, an, an activity I used to use when introducing a period of time, so a couple of times in a year I'd use this with the same classes, is that I would write out the key words, events and people and dates from, a, from the, the whole period. So if I'm going to spend three months looking at um, the medieval history, then I would kind of pre-teach all of the key things I'm going to cover in the next three months just by putting each of them as a heading on a card. I then give the cards out randomly to pupils. I would have the same labels, just as a practical point, the same labels on two or three sets of different coloured cards. And then I might create teams. So the pink team have one set of cards, the blue team have another set of cards. They've all got the same information on. Give them a pile of textbooks and give them access to the internet and then ask each team to research the term. They have to add a, the key information as a summary and then they put them on the timeline. Uh, we might organise the timeline thematically or we might just allow the children to put things on according to the date that they decide is important for that person or event. And then by setting up teams and having different groups in the class and doing this, um, you can create a competition or a sense of competition to really speed the activity up and, and make it more fun and engaging for the children, give them a prize for whoever's got the most of their coloured cards up on the wall and clearly you need to check that the information they're putting up there is accurate and is enough to warrant a, a point for that card. So uh, timeline activity is really good but they can be really active as well. They're not just kind of passive resources up there to refer to. The children can play a part in constructing these and of course I used to use this at the beginning just in one introductory class, but there's no reason why you can't create and enrich a timeline as you go through a scheme of work as well, so that by the end you've constructed a really rich and detailed timeline exploring different themes and concepts that you can then use as a kind of revision tool at the end of the activity. Now, um, T3 was about um, developing conceptual themes. So here's an example of a, of a thematic timeline. Um, now I, I like this just as an example that I found online because it, it really helps the children understand how people inhabit the same period of time and as well as the sequence between, um, between where they appear through the century. So these kinds of activities are really useful. Other things you can do to develop this conceptual thematic awareness is to make sure that you plan in your department over time to revisit the same themes. So here's an example of things that wouldn't be unusual in a uh, in history um, scheme of work running over several years, that it, it would be common to come back to notions of power and governance on a regular basis. It would be common to come back to war and conflict, to changing technology, and of course to the social world, to everyday life. And so as long as we know that every scheme of work that might last for half a term or a term will cover those four issues, that enables us to build the, this sense of connectedness, this sense of continuity and change over time and between periods of time. As an example, um, Tony Benn, a very famous British politician on the left, uh, posed five questions. And it just seemed to me that if we were thinking about just simple, easy ways that you could build up this notion, this theme of power and government, that every time you engage with the story of a ruler or a government or a powerful person or an influential person in history, you could encourage the children to answer these five questions. What power has this person got? Where do they get it from? In whose interest do they exercise it? To whom are they accountable? And how can we and how could the people at the time have got rid of them? Um, Tony Benn suggests this is a question to ask of contemporary politicians but you can turn it around and use it in the historical context. And pretty soon, children would get a sense of how government and power changes over the long sweep of time. And at the end of a year, then you could come back to these questions and just ask them to revisit what do they recall about how these things changed and what kind of patterns and trends emerged over, um, over the teaching. So it's important when you're teaching for a, in a developing deep sense of chronology that we use a, um, a combination of overviews and depth studies. So that's really effectively giving someone the big picture, the big sweep of time, defining a period and an era in fairly general terms, and then developing depth studies to show some of the real detail, the fingertip detail, the fine detail of what life was like, or, or, some, or a depth study which is chosen to illustrate a kind of key turning point or a key aspect of life. 
And we can do this in several ways. Um, we can start with a short overview at the beginning of a scheme of work and then lead into a sequence of teaching which explores different themes. We can start with an overview to provide a, the broad cr chronological context and then go into one or more in-depth inquiries or we can start different groups of children working on different in-depth studies uh, and then pull that work together to create a synthesis. So th here's an example of what that might look like. So here's a scheme of work that starts and ends with an overview but has depth studies in the middle. So if we're teaching about the history of Germany um, in relation to the Second World War, we might start with an overview of changes in Germany before the war. This is 33 and 39, the years when the Nazi party came to power. So we might sketch in that period of time and then look in depth at two particular themes that are significant. And we have chosen them as being significant themes as the teachers. We're going to look at militarization and we're going to look at Kristallnacht, which is uh, the famous event when the Nazis smashed the windows of uh, Jewish shop owners and that was seen as a hugely symbolic event that, that began the open and official um, and subsequently sustained attack on Jewish people in Nazi Germany. So that would illustrate two dimensions of life that would then become significant when we then come to do the next overview, which is the outbreak of war. Here's another example. We might start a scheme of work with three depth studies is a scheme of work on European imperialism, but we don't start with the big picture. We start with three depth studies. You could teach these one after the other, or you could set up project tables in the classroom and have each group look at one of the case studies. And then through the sharing of those uh, depth studies, tease out some key issues. The first one possibly being uh, trade. The second one showing... Um, how much competition there was among European powers to carve up the rest of the world into imperial uh, outposts. And the third one possibly being used to illustrate the impact of technology and the fact that uh, the British had machine guns played a huge part in the opium wars in China. So, so we've got uh, trade, European competition and technology, which would lead into the teacher drawing this together and creating an overview of European imperialism. So different ways in to teach about chronology. So it doesn't all have to be about timelines and teaching the, the, the uh, framework from the front. Um, but what's important to bear in mind is that one of the distinctive features of teaching history is that we're concerned with time and change over time. And so we, we must every now and again make sure that we bring this to the surface and we teach time and chronology explicitly rather than what is sometimes the temptation is just to assume that this is all common sense and then to gloss over it. So uh, what Dawson in particular in his article does is just to start to undo that in practical terms and then the other two references are just some further discussions about um, how this emerges as part of practice and a couple of the suggestions are drawn from these texts as well. So um, we'll be moving on now to part two. Part two where we look at another way of thinking about patterns and change and in particular we'll look at the notion of historical causation.